Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. I'll be preaching this evening from the epistle reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Among the various aspects of Maundy Thursday, one that we focus on is this last meal Jesus shared with his disciples. Their Passover meal, their last supper, where Jesus begins for us what we come to know as the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, the Eucharist, the sacrament of the altar. I'd like to focus on this aspect of Maundy Thursday this evening. Now, that could sound a little bit strange to some of you. After all, we here in Australia are in a time in the life of the church because of the pandemic where we are currently not able to gather to celebrate Holy Communion. And so, this could feel a little bit strange to us, perhaps like giving a lecture on wine tasting when there is no wine to be drunk. But perhaps there is another way of looking at it. Maybe this is exactly the right time to meditate on the blessings of the Lord's Supper where in its absence for a time, we are to grow in our reverence and appreciation for it. After all, they say absence makes the heart grow fonder. And so just maybe during this time, when we are unable to receive the Lord Jesus in his body and blood, maybe this is the time to focus on this precious gift to grow in our desire for the blessings that flow from the Lord's Supper. This is what we're going to do this evening. And we'll meditate especially on how the Lord's Supper embraces the past, the present, and the future. First, the Lord's Supper embraces for us the past. The reason we celebrate the Lord's Supper in the life of the church is that After Jesus shared this meal with his disciples, he said, do this. This isn't optional. Do this, Jesus says. It's a command, even as it contains wonderful promises. But notice the command is to do this in remembrance of me. In other words, this ongoing action that Christ wants to be happening in the church until he returns It's based on something in the past. It's anchored to an event in history. And that event, of course, is the suffering and the death of Jesus. St. Paul says in our text, the meal proclaims the Lord's death. The Lord's Supper has been called by some the pulpit of the laity, In other words, that by our participation in this sacrament, we proclaim to each other and to the world the suffering and the death of Jesus. It sets it before our eyes. But it's not only that Jesus makes this connection between his suffering and death and the Lord's Supper, but of course he gives the meal in that context. Remember when all of this happened? On the night when he was betrayed, which means on the night before he died. The context of Jesus giving us this sacrament is his being handed over into death. And Jesus knows this. He knows this is his last evening with the disciples. Just imagine. Imagine you knew you were going to die tomorrow. And you had one last meal with your closest loved ones. Wouldn't the gravity of that knowledge permeate everything you say and do? 
Well, that's this night for Jesus and his disciples. This is the new covenant, he says, or the new testament, his last will and testament, his final wishes, if you like, and he gives the Lord's Supper in this context. The Lord's Supper embraces the past. The Supper is at the heart of the church's life because the death and resurrection of Jesus are at the heart of the church's life. But next, the Lord's Supper embraces the present. It's so important for us to see this deep connection between Holy Communion and the death of Jesus on the cross, but we dare not turn this sacred meal into mere nostalgia of the past. We don't celebrate the Lord's Supper only to think nice thoughts and feel nice emotions about what Jesus did for us. Remembrance in the scriptures is not only about the past, it's about action in the present. It's about real spiritual power in the present. What do we read? What do we hear in our text? Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. That is for you. This is my blood, which is shed for you. In the Gospels, for the forgiveness of sins, it says. Jesus does not speak of bread or wine, which only symbolize or represent something in the past. He speaks about what they are now for the people of God. This is my body. This is my blood. As I teach young people in our classes about the Lord's Supper, I tell them that to truly understand the church's teaching of the real presence of Christ in Holy Communion, you only need to understand one basic grammatical truth. That is means is. In this holy sacrament, he is present in the present. And he's present for you in his body and blood with the bread and the wine. All that he did for you in the past, being handed over into death, giving his life for your sins, all of the blessings of the new covenant, forgiveness, life and salvation, All of this is not locked away in the past, but available to you in the present as you come to the Lord's Supper and receive the very body given on the cross, the very blood shed for you, now glorified in his resurrection. In our catechism, we confess... What is Holy Communion? It is the real body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given with bread and wine for us Christians to eat and drink. Now, we don't claim to understand with our finite minds how such a wonderful thing is possible. This is a mystery where we take Jesus at his word. You may remember how at the time of the Reformation... This came into dispute. And in his debate, Luther is said to have simply written on the table in Latin, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. And he would return to it again and again. In other words, we take Jesus at his word. We trust him when he says, this is my body, this is my blood for you in the present This supper, it embraces the past, but it has this spiritual power in the present because Jesus is present. And it's only when you see this truth that you'll begin to make any sense of why St. Paul gives such serious warnings in our text about examining oneself before receiving about the importance of discerning the body of the Lord and the danger of eating and drinking judgment on ourselves, we encounter Jesus himself in this sacrament. And so we approach with repentance and reverence. 
The Lord's Supper embraces the past, the present, and the future. Did you hear what St. Paul said? That as we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As the supper reaches back into the past, it also reaches forward into the future. Our Holy Communion liturgy acknowledges this. As we sing of this sacrament being a foretaste of the feast to come. And as we pray, come Lord Jesus, we pray for him to come now in the Lord's Supper, even as we pray for him to come again in glory. And we trust that just as certainly he does, as he came once in the flesh to give his life on the cross, as he comes to us with the bread and wine of the sacrament, just as surely he will come again to judge the living and the dead, to save and redeem his people, to bring us to that feast that knows no end of which the sacrament is a foretaste. That glorious future is depicted in Revelation where the angels and saints are robed in white, singing before the throne of the Lamb, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And so as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we take the words of the angels on our lips. We sing holy, holy, holy. And as we do, we confess that this future glory to which we have been called, this future life with God and the feast that knows no end in the presence of the Lord is already now embraced for us in the Lord's Supper so that the past, the present, and the future come together. From time to time, there is a need for absence. A husband and wife may be forced apart from one another, or for some ill reason, like an illness, they cannot share the fullness of married life, and these can be difficult times. But they can also be times when they grow in love and appreciation for each other and what they have. So perhaps as we live through this strange time of not being able to celebrate Holy Communion and receive the body and blood of Jesus, perhaps this could be for us. A time when God is leading us to repentance and spiritual renewal, especially in a deeper reverence and appreciation for the precious gift that is the body and blood of Jesus in the Lord's Supper. May God grant this to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs>